Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy Rock preaches a sermon titled, You Don't Have to Pretend to Be Perfect, from 1 John chapter 3. Righteousness isn't perfection. Righteousness is being made right by Jesus and being in right relationships with others. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth, and heaven is an evil-destroying, sin-crushing, death-eating supernova of God's presence and love. He didn't lob advice down into the mire of your brokenness. He came to you. Jesus died for you, and now risen, Jesus does surgery on your dead heart so that your heart can be born again, and so you can love others. Hey, if you are new or visiting with us this morning, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, It is no small thing to walk through the doors of a church you've never been in, so welcome. And if you're here maybe for the second or third time, thanks for coming back. I know that sometimes that's an odd thing uh, where you don't really know that many people. I just want you to know that if you are relatively new to this church, welcome to the club because everybody's relatively new to this church except like 25 people, Uh, literally. uh, and they're almost all in the back row there. Uh, so, uh, so I just want to let you know that, like, uh, that, that ev- almost everybody's new here. So um, we're so glad that you're here. As, and what we do is that we talk every week about what it is that we believe because uh, we don't make decisions. Uh, our elders and our staff, we don't make decisions because uh, that's going to make the most money or because we're... Uh, you know, we want to grow the church. We make decisions based on Scripture, upon the vision. And that way, if I'm hit by a bus tomorrow, or if Paul retires at the end of May, no matter what, that our church is going in the direction, May 2024, by the way, uh, <laughs> that our church is going in the same direction. So uh, this is what we believe. This is all taken from Isaiah 61. Number one, there is always hope beyond our brokenness. For those of us who are blind, for those of us who are captive, for those of us who have been in bondage, which is every single person here, uh, we were once a perfect church until you walked through the door. Uh, And in other words, there are no perfect people. All of us are in desperate need of God's healing our brokenness. And we are a community that exists that says there is always hope beyond our brokenness. There's hope in being honest with where you are, and there's hope that God will not leave you there. Amen? Amen. Second, we believe that we're called to trust in our risen Savior. So if you're looking for a church to perform religiosity in, uh, this ain't it. Um, And uh, and those people who want to be religious here and pretend that everything's fine and that they're perfect and that, um, you know, we'll just, I'm too blessed to be distressed. Um, they end up leaving this church, and, and that's one of those things where we say, uh, uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Uh, and the reason why, uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, there are things called blessed subtractions, and the reason why is because you and I, the church will die in America if we are not actually vulnerable. The church will die in America if we're not actually honest with each other and God. If we are too busy performing and not trusting, the church will have zero impact. And here, in this little tiny congregation, we are having an incredible impact because we're taking the risk to be vulnerable and to actually trust God. And the elders, we make decisions and we don't know where the money's going to come from. We gave $180,000 away last year, which is a ridiculous percentage of our annual budget, and and we had zero idea that that we could do that. And then January, somebody gave a check for $183,000. Never happened before in the history of our church. But this is what is happening. We are trusting You are trusting. You're trusting God with your kids. You're trusting God with your finances. You're trusting God with your wounds. You're trusting God with your successes. You're trusting God with your energy and your purpose, and it's working. And that's what we're called to do as a church. And and, and lastly, we believe that we're called to bring restoration. We don't do thoughts and prayers at this church. We love well. We love extravagantly well. We, we, we pour out 
our finances and our time and our energy for the sake of other people? How much does a soul cost? At the end of our life, we would give everything, every dime that we have to save someone that we love. And so now we just give extravagantly of our time and our energy and our money and our purpose for the sake of people who are not yet in these doors. And each week, they come. And each week, you get saved. And each week, you get healed. And that's what we do at this church. These don't happen by accident. They're a choice that we make. That word to choose weighs about 1,000 pounds in your life. And so we choose every week to follow Jesus. We choose every day to follow Jesus, just like we choose every day to love our spouses and to love our children and to go to work and to put your pants on. (laughs) Amen? Amen? So let's make this choice together. And let's declare. Put some pepper on it this morning. Are you ready? We are disciples who walk intentionally with God. Therefore, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first. I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work. Amen? Amen. Oh, man. Okay, so can I have permission to speak to your heart of hearts? Yes. You sure? Yes. Because what I'm going to talk about today, every week, every week, I, I, I praise God and I lament that I preach. Because every week, God drags me through Uh, the scripture and says, okay, here it is. This is is going to be real in your life. And every week I have the chance to be fake with you or I have the chance to be real with you. And I choose to be real with you about what this looks like. So I'm going to preach to your heart this morning and to my own heart. And I'll tell you what's going on. I'm not going to tell you about what happened in my life in 1989. I'm going to tell you what happened on Tuesday. Okay? Here we go. We've been in 1 John. 1 John, if you read it, would take 19 minutes to read the entire book. That's if you go slow. Seven if you just are trying to get through it. It's not a long letter. But there's a verse in the beginning that really helps you understand the rest of what John is saying. And it goes like this. Read this with me. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So when someone asks you, how are you, and if you say fine, you have biblical permission to say to them, liar. (laughs) Here's verse 9. Ready? Read this with me. If we confess our sins, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why do I say these verses make everything else in John make sense? Well, for the rest of John's letter, he's made and will make Example after example of the choice we can make, choices we can make, what to do and what to not do. First John 2 says that the world wants you um, uh, to hate. Hate is an umbrella term. It's, an, it's the energy that you would have in your life to make another person pay so that it benefits you. The opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Hate is energy that you have where you're trying to get someone to make them pay so that it benefits you. Love is energy where you're trying to bless someone and you're willing to pay for it. Does that make sense? So John says the world wants you to love, and if you love, God is in you, and if you hate, that's not God. In 1 John 2, he says, the world wants you to lust after things, to have things try and satisfy you, and they never will. And the solution in 1 John 3 is to abide in God because he will always satisfy you. Does that make sense? But what if I hate? What if I lust? Does that mean I've lost Jesus? Does that mean I'm destined for hell? Does that mean I've lost God's favor or blessing or protection? No, because you're a hot mess. And if you try and pretend that you're not, that's what will lead you to never pray, to never confess, and then you'll end up 
pretending that everything's fine in your life while all of your decisions are leading you straight to hell. That's what John wants you to avoid. There is always a solution to the problem of your hate or your lust or your disobedience or your lawlessness. It's to stop pretending that everything's fine in your life to say, I do have issues going on in my life and there is a way home. I will gladly tell the truth about what's going on in me and receive forgiveness. And it's not an I thing. It's a we thing. If we say we have no sin, if we confess our sins, 21st, America, 21st century American Christians are I, I, I. I just got to, I will, if I have to, if I can, if I do, I, 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 I. It's like we all are in the Navy, I, I, <laughs> right? So it's a we thing. We do this together always. So when you read 1 John, you're going to read things like, hey, don't do this, otherwise, like, God's not in you. And you're going to go, you're going to feel condemned by those verses. 1 John 1 is the way home. John is trying to help us simply understand here is death and here is life. And when you find yourself in death, the way forward and out is to be honest and then God will redeem every part of your life. So can we pray? Lord Jesus, come now. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Open our ears, open our eyes. I pray against all distraction, all sleepiness, all anything opposed to Christ that would be trying to clog our ears or prevent us from listening. Not today, devil. Get out in the name of Jesus and go to Jesus to be judged. Father, this is your time. And we pray to our, we ask our own souls, we say to our own souls, awaken, O my soul, and all that is within me. And I give my full attention to you, Jesus. And all God's people said? Amen. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Have I given you a preamble to understand that when you read a verse and it feels like you're being condemned, that there is a way out? You ready to get your butt kicked? Here we go. 1 John 3, verse 4. Read this with me loudly. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. John says that anyone who practices sin is lawlessness. You can be ignorant of your lawlessness, or you can know what you're doing. I'll never forget on my birthday when I turned 38 years old, I got pulled over by the CHP, upon which the CHP got out of his car. The officer got out of his car, pointed his gun at me, and said over the loudspeaker, "Turn, get out with your hands out right now. And I didn't know how to do both at the same time. And so I got out, and he said, turn around. And so I went like this. I did a pirouette on Los Osos Valley Road. And he said, back towards the car. And I got back to the car. And then he cuffed me. And I said, it's my birthday today. And he said, congratulations. And I said, I'm a pastor. And he said, I don't care. And I said, what's going on? He goes, your car is stolen. And I said, that's fascinating. I, I, don't, I don't think it is. And the DMV and AAA and the DMV and AAA had messed up the DMV registration and things got crossed in the mail and one car that I sold got mixed up with the VIN number and the address of my car and then I was practicing lawlessness. I didn't even know that I, had, that I was driving an unregistered vehicle which the VIN number was all messed up and that's why I had a nine millimeter pistol pointed at my head, right? Doesn't matter. If you know it or not, lawlessness is lawlessness. The word, though, to practice in this verse weighs about 500 pounds. To practice is to attend to something, to nurture, to cultivate, to repeat, to spend time investing in, to get better or more proficient in. Yes? So if you make a practice of sinning, what does that look like? Well, let me give you an obvious example. How about addiction? We spend our time and money feeding an addiction, and I don't care if it's alcohol or drugs or brownies, right? 
We feed the addiction when we're sad, when we're happy, <laughs> when we're bored, when we're stressed, when we're celebrating, when we're mourning. Feeding the addiction is always there because it's our practice. We practice our addiction and involve it in every area of our life. Sometimes practicing our sin looks like just holding on to something. Like when we hold on to our power and control, we find ways to stay in charge. We find ways to look for what needs to get done and then make others bend their life to our will. We nag, we yell, we berate. Or we just work faster and faster and ignore our mistakes and how we run, other, run us others over. I, yeah, I read your email. <laughs> Sorry. We practice our sin of power and control by feeding our entitlement that we should have things the way that we want when we want them. And we starve our faith of letting Jesus show a different way by postponing or abandoning prayer in favor of getting stuff done. Sound familiar? Terribly quiet in this room right now. <laughs> don't pretend that you don't have sin. Just look to the person next to you and say, you're a sinner. <laughs> Why? Like, there's no, there's no condemnation in it. There's no condemnation in it, right? Jesus has taken all the condemnation. All right, all right, come back, come back. <laughs> Practicing sin is in our attitudes, it's in our behavior, it's in our pace, it's in our calendar, it's in our priorities, it's in how we spend our money. Does that make sense? By the way, I'm only preaching to myself right now. That's my issue, power and control. Shall I preach to you? Do you practice the sin of holding on to your resentments and self-righteousness? Yeah. I'm still preaching to myself, but maybe I'm preaching to you right now. Do you always find a way to accumulate evidence of how they let you down again? That's practicing a resentment. You always find evidence like you're, like you're loading that ammo clip or you're gathering your evidence for the prosecution later? That's practicing your resentments. How about practicing fear? Do you constantly paint yourself into a corner of it's all going to fall apart? Or do you have conversations in your head with people before they've even had the conversations because you already know what they're going to say? And so then you have emotions about what they're going to say before they even say it because you know what they're going to say. And then you're mad. That's practicing your sin. Do you, do you say, well, I can't do that and I can't do this because they're going to say that and they're going to feel that way. That's practicing your fear. I know. I have access to all your text messages. My buddy works at the NSA. It's great. Do you practice your faithlessness? Do you ask everyone else for what you think they, you should do in your life but never God? Do you practice worthlessness? Every single time you make a mistake, you feel like you've got to beat yourself up so that you show how sorry you are. John says, whether you're ignorant of your practices or you know what you're doing, that's sin. It's lawlessness. And why did Jesus come? To destroy these practices that we have so that the things which are feeding off your very soul, which are encouraging you to practice sin, those are called demons. The things that are causing chaos and death in your life, that all of that would be gone forever. And what you build and the family that you create and the work that you do would last for all eternity. That's what God wants for you. You want to stop practicing sin? Yes. 
One person. That is the only evidence that we need that revival has come. The rest of you are like, I'm not a sinner. I don't care what 1 John says, one. I mean, that applies to my spouse. That's why I brought them here, right? But I'm good, right? Do you want to stop practicing sin? Yes. Oh, good. Here we go. Here's how. Ready? Read with me. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. How do you stop practicing your sin? Abide. Confess. Abide. No one who keeps on sinning has either sin, seen him or known him. What is John saying? Abide in Jesus. Talk to him all throughout the day. Listen to his faithful and gentle voice. You want your sin to die? Stop trying to stop and start talking to Jesus about it. Does that make sense? Alcoholics and addicts don't get free from their addictions by their vain popping efforts to stop. I'm going to stop now. Right now, I'm going to stop sinning. Does it work? Did they do it? Now. I'm putting so much energy in it. Why do I feel like I'm Ric Flair, or like Hulk Hogan? No, right? No, I mean, it's like not, right? That's not how you stop. You don't stop by focusing on the sin or whatever you're dealing with. Oh, I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. That's not how you stop. The most powerful psychopharmological chemical addictive components ever created on planet Earth are rendered impotent the moment that you start saying to other people, I'm helpless. I'm a sinner. I can't figure it out. I don't know what to do. That makes no sense. Only if God is involved does it make sense that you would stop the practice of your sin when you start talking to God and other people about it. Dane Ortland, in his remarkable book, Gentle and Lowly, writes, it is the most counterintuitive aspect of Christianity that we are declared right with God, not once we begin to get our act together, but once we collapse into honest acknowledgement that we never will. And we collapse into the honest acknowledgement of our brokenness into the arms of Jesus, into the arms of people sitting next to you who are no better than you, who struggle just like you do, who are falling apart and dying in a pile. I know your stories. I know the pain that you carry. I know the wounds that you have. I know the people that you're hoping and praying will just say yes one day to sanity and life and Jesus himself. I know. You come here with all of your skills and all of your beauty and all of your purpose and all of your victory and all of your pain. John continues. Read with me. Little children. I love this. He's not trying to be pejorative or mean or dismissive. He's trying to make it simple for us little ones. And that's all of us. Read again. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Let me make something really clear. Righteousness isn't perfection. Remember 1 John 1? Anybody who claims to be with sin is deceiving themselves. They're a liar. They don't... They're, so righteousness, then, isn't perfection. What is righteousness? Well, stop pretending to be perfect. That's first step. I'm preaching to myself right now. Andy, for the love of God, stop trying to be perfect. Righteousness is being made right, not by my efforts, but by Jesus. It's being in right relationships with other people. What does that look like? It sure as heck isn't pretending that you're perfect. Why? Because if I pretend that I'm perfect and I only tell you about the seven sins I committed from 1978, which is a year after I was born, 
1984, which is right before I said yes with Bumblebee at Miracle Ranch Camp to invite Jesus into my life, then what am I telling you? I'm telling you that I'm fine and that you should hide all of the issues that you have in your life and not share them with anybody and pretend that you're just glorious. (laughs) And what will we create? We will create a culture of perfection and performance. And then what will people think who look at us from the outside, who lives are dying in a pile, and they see you buying the booze? They see you lying on your taxes. They see you speeding down the road. They hear your arguments. They know all your stuff. You can't hide it. What are they going to think? Stupid hypocrites. That's what they're going to think. Now hear me. John and the Apostle Paul and Jesus and me, we're not saying... Oh, just, you know, full throttle on your sin. You know, just stop pretending that you uh, don't have problems. So so that means, you know, just like, you know, just add fuel to it. You know, like, oh, yeah, I'm a hot mess. I'm going to go over here and keep on doing this. It's not what I'm saying. We're not saying you can just do whatever you want, put the quarter in the forgiveness machine and say in Jesus' name and out comes that solution. And then that's your relationship with God, treating God like this cosmic forgiveness vending machine. That's not how faith works. That's a transaction with a thing, not a relationship with a person. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth, and heaven is an evil-destroying, sin-crushing, death-eating supernova of God's love and affection for you. And guess what? In heaven, you're going to talk about your life here on earth. You know what that's called? Judgment Day. I think it's the first time I've ever preached about Judgment Day. Are you ready? It's exciting. You're going to stand before Jesus, and you're going to come face to face with all your failures and all the horrors of your life and all the horrors of your sin practices, which led to people getting hurt, which led to God's kingdom shrinking, which led to you omitting what you could have done to make a difference in someone's life. And, and, and that helped the devil's grip increase in their life rather than decrease, you're going to have honest conversations with God in heaven about that. And there with Jesus, you will be judged. So pretending like those things don't happen in your life isn't going to help. You can't stand before God and say, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> it's going to be like, girl, here's the movie of your life. This is what you did. You'd be like, bro, there's no hiding this. And if you're like, nope, nope, didn't do it, didn't do it, it's not like the judgment is going to change. I have things that Jesus is going to confront me on this last week where I failed and I broke promises and I will face consequences in those conversations with Jesus. And I will see the pain and I will feel it. And then what? I will be forgiven. I will be loved by my Savior because even in the moment of my judgment, Jesus himself is sustaining me by his love. I will be made healed. I will be healed and made whole, not because I've hidden the things that are broken in my life, but because as I've brought them forward to Jesus, he says, my blood has covered and paid that one too. The more that I bring out, the more that I will be healed. And on judgment day, everything will be brought out, which means everything will be healed And that's why heaven has no tears. So why do we delay heaven then? Heaven starts not with everything just being great. Heaven starts with all of your stuff coming out and having it be healed by the very love of God. And that's the entrance into this kingdom here on earth is all of your stuff out and honest with it, 
so that it can be healed. That is practicing righteousness. Practicing righteousness is not being perfect. Read that with me. Practicing righteousness is not being perfect. Are you sure? Practicing righteousness is choosing to trust God. It is choosing to obey. It is choosing to follow his directions. And when you don't, it is choosing to be honest about your failures and honest that you need help and asking for it. It's saying, I'm a hot mess right now. I'm trying to be superwoman, and I can't. I'm totally stuck right now in my fear or performance. Or if you need help filling in the blank, just ask the person next to you. They know what your issues here. That's why they dragged you here this morning. For the love of God, please. And say, read this with me. I need help. I need forgiveness. I need to know who I've hurt so I can make it better and I need to learn a better way. God, will you help me? My friend, will you help me? I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, man, that's a great prayer. Thank goodness I'll just skip the friend part and do all that work with God himself and never have to be a hot mess in front of anybody else. Sorry, friend, it does not work that way. This weekend, we had a prayer retreat. On Friday, we read the definitions of things that every single human being struggles with. And each person just began to raise their hand as they related with them. And by the end of the time that we raised our hand, the more that we raised our hand, it was this crazy thing of like, as hands go up that I struggle with this, so does hope. As hands go up, so does joy. As hands go up, so does love. As hands go up, the shame goes down. As hands go up, the fear goes down. Do you see how powerful it is? Practicing righteousness is choosing to follow God, but it's also choosing to be honest about where you need help. So if you could relate with me, could you raise your hand and keep it raised? If you relate with me, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Are you struggling with fear right now? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you struggling with hopelessness right now? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you performing and trying to be perfect somehow? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you tired of trying to control everything? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you stung by shame and guilt? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you still working to forgive someone? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Are you needing help to figure out how to pray all this through? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Look around. You're not alone. Every hand is raised. Nearly every hand is raised. (laughs) You are literally practicing. Okay, put your hands down. You're literally practicing righteousness right now. You don't have to pretend to be perfect. Again, Dane Ortland writes, if you are in Christ, you have a friend who, in your sorrow, will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too bound up with yours. And I never knew this until this last week at this prayer retreat. I always thought that I had to bear the weight of the sin of the consequences of it. I always thought that I had to bear making it all up. That's why I struggle with perfection and performance my entire life. Until this weekend in the prayer retreat, and I just got wrecked. I, I demonstrate what it looks like to get healing prayer on Friday and Debbie, who is our minister of Razzle Dazzle, does this with me, and she says this awful question, how are you doing, Andy Rock? And it's just like, I just had this tick of PTSD from that question, and <laughs> she didn't know where she was going. She was just trusting the Holy Spirit, and then it just, at the end of that prayer time, it was, I realized that all these years, what I've been doing is trying to beat myself up and bear all the weight of the consequences of my sin and not letting Jesus bear any of it with me as though Jesus just lobs down a pep talk from heaven and says, get your act together. Hey, you know what? Just, you know, clean up your life before you come to me. Bear all the weight of the sin before you come to me. Make it all better, all by yourself before you come to me. So here I am scurrying around every time I must make a mistake, I do more, I do faster. Can you relate with me? Are there any hands that would go up on this one? 
This is the thing I don't understand about the glory of God, is that he bears the weight of my sin and its consequences with me. I don't bear that alone. I don't have to constantly strive to be perfect anymore. It doesn't mean that I stop obeying. It just means that I'm no longer trying to make up for all the bad stuff that I've done. So John continues. This is really cool. Are you ready? Here's hope. Read with me out loud. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. Because he's born of God. And you read this verse, and you probably think, dang it, I can't do that. Mm, That's your religiousness. Please kill it right now. It's not what it means. You ready? When God makes you new, that part of your heart is born again. And that born again or brand new part of your heart has no appetite for death. Does anybody like um, roasted and sautéed donkey ears covered with escargot? (laughs) That's so nasty. Just covered in old garbage. Does anybody, does that sound appetizing to anybody? No. You're not tempted by it. You're like, huh? You, You don't want it, right? Yeah? The parts of your heart that God has made new don't have an appetite for that garbage anymore. Look, um, in all of our lives, we've dealt with sins in the past that we no longer deal with. Why? Because the part of your heart which has been born again doesn't want them anymore. The invitation here is for you to be more and more and more made alive by him so that your loves change and your appetites change and what you want change. Amen? Amen. Does this transformation happen all at once? Are you sure? Ready? Do this with me. Make it all happen at once. Right now. I'm going to change all now. I'm going to forgive everybody now. Oh, it doesn't work that way? Huh. Takes time. But as you practice righteousness, obeying, listening, following directions, and when you mess up, being honest, (sighs) the healing happens faster than you could ever imagine. Now, the next verse feels like John's going to ship gears, but he's not. And what he's about to say is so important. We're almost done. And then we'll go watch the Aztecs (laughs) tomorrow. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not. Yeah. See, the way that you practice righteousness, as opposed to practicing sin which leads to death, is by loving the people around you. It's a remarkable thing. See, when you start saying, you know, I'm not going to be mad that they're doing the right thing because it makes me look bad. I'm just going to join them in doing it. It's a remarkable thing when you really start laying your life down for other people because it puts everything in a perspective. So this last week, when I was gone, uh, I was helping uh, Zed's dad. We were throwing a 50th birthday party for him. And uh, we had to get a bunch of propane. And as we were getting a bunch of propane, I, get, I got to meet an employee, a kid at a, a, at a Chevron station, maybe, maybe 20, 21, 22 years old. His name was Arthur. And he was really nice. There was a really annoying man in front of me. Um, and he would not stop being quiet. And he was buying scratchers. And he had lots of things to say. And Arthur was super kind to him. And I was just like, 
Wow. I'm a pastor. I'm getting annoyed. The Chevron employee in training, Arthur, is nicer than I am. And I went up to Arthur and I said, Arthur, can I get some propane? He goes, absolutely. So he came out. He's just this quirky kid, you know, like glasses, long hair, you know, just kind of odd, quiet. But as he starts doing the propane and doing the things, I looked at him. I said, you really enjoy your job, don't you? And he goes, I do. And I said, you really like helping people. And I, he said, I do. And I said, that is so cool, man. Like, I don't know if, I don't want to be weird or anything like that, but like, I'm a pastor, and I just want you to let you know that, like, I can see, like, the light coming out of you. Like, because when you're kind and when you're nice, like, I can really see it. And he stops, and he looks at me, and he goes, what? <laughs> I said to him, when you're kind and, and when you really care for other people, like, I, he goes, how did you, like, what do you, and I said, like, you were listening to that guy, and he wasn't the easiest guy to listen to, but you were kind to him. And he goes, he started tearing up, and he goes, you have no idea what I'm dealing with in my life and what season I am in right now, but I cannot even believe that you just said that to me. He goes, really? I said, yeah, man, you got God coming out of you. And he goes, really? I said, yeah. So I gave him the last $20 that I had as a tip. I'm not trying to brag that I gave somebody $20. How much does a soul cost? Seriously. You say it's priceless. It's not. It's not. Sometimes it's 20 bucks. Sometimes it's just your love and generosity towards a person that you do not know. Instead of just going, eh, nah. No. Because that $20, when I gave him a tip, brought Arthur to tears. And I said, do you pray? And he's like, I'm gonna. <laughs> I gave him my phone number. I said, text me any time. He hasn't. I'm gonna go back to that Chevron and find Arthur. <laughs> Why? Why? Because when you love another person, you are practicing righteousness. You are bringing the kingdom of God and heaven itself into their life. And it's not because you're perfect. It's not because your life is all together. It's because we stand under the banner of the cross, which says that all of my sins have been paid for by my loving Savior and creator of my soul. That I've been redeemed not because I am enough, but because he's enough. And if there's a way that I could show another person just a little bit of love and a little bit of grace and a little bit of kindness, then all of a sudden, all the places in my life where I want to just punish myself and wreck myself and destroy myself, I will then finally be willing to receive what is freely given. And it happens in love. And you are so well equipped to do that. And you are doing that. And I love you for it. Amen? Amen. Stand and receive the benediction. We have incredible food for you. If you want to come across the street and pray this into your life, come join for Table Talk. We have custom coffee for you. It's leaded. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. That's his delight in you and gave you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. It, Good Friday, 6.30, Easter egg hunt, my house, noon, Easter Sundays, and we'll celebrate Jesus again. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Holy Week. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California, and serves communities across the Central Coast, Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.